So today we conclude our study of the ancient disciplines of the church. We began in May, uh, tools that uh, are developed for a deepening relationship to Jesus Christ and our relationship with Him and what that looks like and such. We have, uh, we have given you a toolbox for you to be able to, uh, to process some of those things that, that uh, we, you have been able to, uh, to learn about as you have sought to understand uh, God, and we've given you ways of connecting that to what we refer to as a gospel identity, uh, not, a, not a modern identity which seeks itself within, not a traditional identity which seeks itself ex- without and from our family and from our, our clan, but rather from a gospel identity which seeks it from Christ. And as we worked through each of those, Megan provided for us uh, p- banners that were able to ask us questions about it, that <clears throat> we asked, what, I- what are those things that we looked at? We looked at how we've been practicing and what challenges uh, do we have within each of those things. Uh, obviously, we really took that on for prayer and fasting and, and meditation and study, and then we got over to some of those over that not so much. Apparently, we ran out of interest at that particular point. But that's Okay. Because that's going to go on. You're going to always have those issues before you, and we're going to have to struggle through them as we, as we begin to understand what they are like. We, we began with the inner disciplines of meditation and prayer. Uh, we looked at fasting and study, and then we moved on to the outer disciplines of, of simplicity and solitude, submission and service. We finally turned to the corporate disciplines, the things that we practice together, such as confession and worship and guidance, and today, celebration. Celebration comes at the end of our study, the conclusion of our study, because we can't celebrate unless we know what we're celebrating. Uh, we, we tap into the carelessness which Jesus referred to in the Sermon on the Mount. When he said, do not worry about what you'll eat, uh, what you'll dr- wear, or what you, anything along those lines, it's life not more f- than food and the body more than clothing. And stick a pin in that. We're going to come back to that just a second about the kind of callousness that that seems to present. But, but celebration is formed within this knowledge that you and I are loved. Just sit in that for a second. You are loved. And what a blessing it is to know that you are loved. And in that love, you are free from condemnation. Can I get an amen? You are loved and you are free from condemnation. And so because of that, we are careless. But that doesn't mean we're careless. And on Sundays like today, where we, we once again are confronted with the, the terrible nature of guns and gun violence in this country, when we once again look at the people on our southern border and wonder, what in the world is going on? How could we as Americans be doing this? When we look around again at some of the horrible things that are going on in our nation, and we a- have to ask the question, what Jesus was meaning when he said, don't worry about your life, what you'll eat or what you'll drink or what you'll wear is li- not life more than food and the body more than clothing. Don't you want to kind of say, what the pick is going on here, Jesus? I mean, I maybe have enough to eat. I may have enough uh, a roof over my house, my whole head and all those sorts of things. But what about these other people? What's going on with that? We all know somebody, I know, and we may even be somebody who, when it comes to faith, abandons common sense and takes the whole faith thing into some sort of magical direction it never was meant to go. We know people, and we may even be people, who, who, who basically say, oh, you know, if, if God uh, wanted to take those, those people in, in Ohio and, and El Paso and, and in Gilroy, He just wanted another little angel, right? I, the word I want to say with that doesn't isn't appropriate in church. We all know people who say things like, I don't need life insurance. I I, I don't need to eat right. I don't have to deal deal with the issues within my own life. I don't have to deal with the, 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 the issues I've got against another human being because God is my, 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 my Lord and my Savior and everything is fine. We all know people who will say, here, here's all the money I have. I'm going to give it to you. God will give me more. Actually, I like to meet more of those people than I do, but (laughs) the problem is, is that the care less people that Jesus is talking about are people who are guided by the Spirit. They are people who use the tools that we have been unpacking so that they know what is what and where is where. And because of that, 
Genuine celebration is connected to, wait for it, the word you don't want to hear, obedience. Could have talked all day and not said that. Genuine celebration is connected to obedience, without which celebration becomes a party spirit. All I want to do is have a good time. Girls just want to have fun. I want to just have a good time. Or it becomes one of those situations where it becomes dependent upon God so that we go to church and we read the liturgy and we sing the songs and we pray in the hope that God will somehow be able to give us a shot of joy to make it through and heavenly transfusion to bypass our daily misery. Oh, Lord, I don't want to hear about any more shootings out there. I don't want to hear about migrant kids on the, on the border. I don't want to hear about the homeless in Burbank and Los Angeles. I don't want to hear about that. Just let me get past my daily misery. The disciplines inform us that God's desire isn't for our good time. I, I, I think that God probably enjoys it when we have a good time. I mean, look how much wine he made at the wedding at Cana. But it, that's not his desire because he knows that that's not exactly what we need because a good time quickly becomes empty. Nor is it to bypass our misery because God often speaks to us most in the midst of our misery. Are you pissed off at the things that are going on around us in the world right now? Yeah. Good. You should be. This is not normal. We should be angry. But the tools that we have been looking at since May channel that anger to go in the right direction. See, God doesn't want us to bypass our misery. God wants us to deal with it, to hear it, to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. It is God's desire to transform joy and sorrow into celebration. <laughs> Years ago now, I think it was, I don't know, you, you'll, one of you will be able to tell me, I'm sure. We lost a young man in this congregation by the name of Ryan Fiervanti. He was killed in a terrible car crash. This church prayed for him and prayed for him and prayed for him, and he died, 17, 16 years old. It just it racked this congregation. The Sunday after he had died, his parents, Ron and Peggy Firavanti, came into the sanctuary and worshiped with us. They didn't stay home. They didn't... They didn't put the black armband on their, on their arm. They didn't, they didn't sit and cry. They wanted to be with their family and cry here. That's what celebration is about. That's why we have the gift of celebration. It is God's desire to both tra transform both joy and sorrow into celebration. Have you ever had anybody give you this lie? God will never give you more than you can handle. Again, that word keeps floating around in my head that I can't really say in church. It has to do with cow excrement. <clears throat> Anybody who's ever had that lie given to them knows that there must be more to being careless than carelessness. Living life for the buzz and what we'll get in the end, pie in the sky, by and by. You see, without the disciplines, we're on the horns of the dilemma. Trust Jesus and party on for party's sake or live lives of desperation, quiet or otherwise. You see, the real reason that we have placed celebration at the conclusion of our study is now we have a full toolbox. We have a hammer and we have a chisel. We have a screwdriver and we have a wrench. We have both metric and standard... Uh, um, what are they called, Jay? Help me. Standard sockets. sockets. Thank you. My brain just suddenly went off, and that's why I shouldn't go on spelunking and things. <laughs> Richard Foster writes this. He says, meditation heightens our spiritual sensitivity, which in, two, in turn leads us where? To prayer. And very soon, we will discover that prayer involves fasting. Oh, boy. Why? As an accompanying means informed by these three disciplines, we can effectively move into study, which then gives us discernment about ourselves and the world in which we live. Then he says, from there, through simplicity, we live with others in integrity. I love that. We live with others in integrity. Solitude allows us to be genuinely present to people when we are with them. Through submission, we live with others without manipulation. 
That's a key. And through service, we are a blessing to them. Confession frees us from ourselves and releases us to worship. Worship opens the door to guidance. All these disciplines freely exercised bring forth the doxology of celebration. Amen? That is the gift that we have within that. The disciplines, you see, build like stair steps, one upon the other, giving us insight as they deepen our gratitude toward what God has given, given us, centering us in a gospel identity. But because the disciplines are tools to work with God in life's complexities, they are not always linear stair steps. Sometimes you need a hammer and sometimes you need a screwdriver. Faith is a, is a life that is a relationship based with God and lived with God. And because of that, and it's lived in the intricacies of life, so sometimes faith logic is one plus one equals fish. It just does. I don't know. And as a people, we're trying to figure this out. How do we live this way? How do we work this way? Sometimes the disciplines are stair steps. Sometimes they're monkey bars. And sometimes they're mud puddles. You know how to, you know how to traverse a, a stair step, right? A stair step, sir, we, we do that every day. We know how to do that. This particular set of stair steps is in the Vatican Library. That's a cool set of stair steps, Right? Very cool set of stairs. So if you know how to walk up a set of stairs, you, you start off on the bottom step, probably. Sometimes you can do two, but let's say we do one. You put one foot on the first step, you step up and go to the second step. If you step up and don't keep that first foot there, you are going to face plant. Not a good thing. So we climb a step by putting one foot over the other. Once this first step is securely planted, then we plant the next one and we go on. And the same is true of the disciplines. You build from one understanding to another. It can take a long, long, long time. To go up those stairs, it will take a long time. But, but here's the good news. Are you going anywhere? We gotta, we gotta, we're going to work this through for a long time thing. It can take a long time, but it is a solid trust and obey, and there's no other way kind of a thing. That's how you cross stair steps. Stop. Go. That's not how you do this. You know what those things are? When's the last time you tried to do a monkey bar? That was about 800 pounds ago is what that was. You cross a monkey bar by reaching out and grabbing a bar, right? You grab that bar, and then you reach out and you grab the next bar. And then what do you do for the first hand? You let it go, right? So that you can reach forward and grab the other one. And you let go, and you reach forward and grab the other one. It's different than crossing a stair step. You have to let go of the past, and you have to take hold of something new, the future. You have to let go of the thing that's held you, what you've trusted, and the thing that has borne your weight. When you climb a stair, your weight is on two points. Sure, for just a second, but it's on two points. On a monkey bar, that's not how you do it. When you cross a monkey bar, you've got to hang your weight on both and then let go of the past and trust the future. And there are monkey bars all over the Bible. When Abraham was told in Genesis 12 to pick up everything and move to the Holy Land, and he did, that's a monkey bar. When in Acts chapter 9, when Jesus told a disciple by the name of Ananias to go to a place called Straight Street and see Inspector Javar, Paul of, or Saul of Tarsus, to his Jean Valjean, and he did, that's a, monkey bar. that's a monkey bar. In Acts chapter 10, when Jesus told Peter, hey, Peter, shellfish is now on the diet. That's a monkey bar. It builds from the past, but you have to let go of that past. Monkey bar discipline is God calling us to grab hold of the deep truths of our faith, to not let them go, to know that they are really, really important, but then to reach out in grace and forgiveness and to let go and do a new thing. And to do that, you need discipline. You need the tools. You need to know the things that we've talked about. And you've got to be strong enough in the truth in tandem which builds on the next truth. Playing on the monkey bars is hard. 
that kid looks like he's having a great time. He probably weighs three pounds. <laughs> but playing in the monkey bars forces you to use different muscles. It forces you to let go of what you know and look toward what you hope for. And that's scary. But it's no more near, nowhere near as scary as this. Now, Chris didn't quite get me the slide exactly the way I wanted it because the kid is playing in the mud puddle. And that's a whole different sermon. <laughs> right? But I want you to picture that kid not playing in the mud puddle. I want you to picture him jumping over the mud puddle. You ever jumped over a mud puddle? You got new shoes on, preachers and sneakers. And, um, you know, it, 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 it's, when you go jumping over a mud puddle, you, you're, you're scared because you might fall into the mud and get all muddy and your mom's going to be mad. You leave everything you know for something else. In Hebrews chapter 11, we find the iconic word, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Mark Schultz put it this way. He said, faith is coming to the edge of all you know and trusting God will give you something to stand on or you'll be taught to fly. Both describe a mud puddle. In chapter 11 of Hebrews, the author then goes on, an author, by the way, whom I believe is Priscilla, but we won't go into that right now. And Priscilla writes this, she talks about faith as something that is the assurance of thing hoped for and the conviction of thought not seen. She says, and guess what? When you have that kind of faith, Abel still speaks through his faith. Enoch was taken so he didn't experience death. Noah, heir to God's righteousness. Abraham, by faith, obeyed and when put to the test, passed. Mud puddle. The faith of Isaac and his son Jacob made them heirs of the promise. Senior citizens, Sarah's descendants, were as many as the stars in heaven and the grains of sand in the seashore. Mud puddle. Moses, he was hidden by his folks because the king had ordered him murdered, but they weren't afraid. Mud puddle. He chose the mud puddle of the Red Sea in the wilderness with his people. The Egyptians, not so much. By faith, Jericho became a fixer-upper. By faith, a prostitute, prostitute by the name of Rahab became Aunt Rahab, mud puddle. She goes on to write about Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah and David and Samuel and the prophets who conquered kingdoms, administered justice, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lion, quenched the raging fire, escaped the edge of the sword, won strength out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight, received their dead back by resurrection, were tortured, suffered uh, mocking and flogging, chains and imprisonment, stoned and not in the fun way, sawn in two, killed in the sword, going about in animal skins, destitute, persecuted, tormented, wandering in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground. They were able to do all of this because they had the tools and they knew how to use them. And one of the reasons that we are facing the situations that we are facing in the world today is that we do not have the tools and we do not know how to use them. We do not know how to stand, take a stand for Christ, and instead we are taking a stand for the Republican Party or the Democratic Party, and that's not the call of Christ, but that's for another sermon in a few weeks. We need to use these tools to build a community that is able to stand in a prophetic way against the evils of today. We need to have celebration in the midst of losing 29 people in a weekend. We need to have celebration because we know that we are free from condemnation and that we are free because we know who God calls and we know that God calls us and He also prepares. And we know that we celebrate because we know who we are celebrating with. They're sitting in this room and whom we are celebrating. It's what we are reminded about at this table. We are reminded of the fact that God loves us so much that He was willing to become sin for us and be broken for us. On the night in which our Lord and Savior was betrayed, He took bread and after giving thanks, He broke it, saying, this is my body, which is broken for you. In a like manner, our Lord also took the cup, saying, this is my blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins. He said, as often as you eat of this bread, as often as you drink of this cup, this cup and this bread does not become the blood and body of Christ. You do. We do. Let's pray.
Good and gracious God, thank you for the gift of community of faith. It seeks to struggle together to learn the tools of the faith to be able to speak your grace and truth into the world. Lord, we confess those times in which we have not done that, and yet we know that we do that and under no condemnation, for you have already taken that for us. But let us live our lives out in grace and strength and truth and peace. For this we ask in the strong and loving name of Jesus. Amen.